Okay, great. Um, just to get started, so I, I'd first like to thank um, Denise, Andre, and Melanie for all of the hard work to get this um, conference up and running. I think it's a really great opportunity for, one, all of us to finally meet each other. But um, yeah, and also thank you for, for letting me speak today. Um, so my name is Christine Boone, and I am at the very tail end of my PhD at the University of Waterloo, and I study quantum computing. Um, and I'm also a researcher at Quantum Benchmark, which makes software to diagnose and also correct errors in quantum systems. So I was always, I was the kind of person that liked math when I was a kid. And um, it, when I was entering into high school, I was trying to figure out how can I actually apply math and make a job out of it? So I remember in high school physics class, we spoke about the double slit experiment. And that was very eye-opening, I think, for the kind of personality I had because it made absolutely no sense and it was extremely counterintuitive. Um, and that's kind of what directed me on the path of doing physics in undergrad. Uh, I did my undergrad at the University of Calgary, and I did it actually in astrophysics. Um, at the time, I, I was very into space and looking at stars at night. And yeah, it, it was a very interesting field to be part of and to try out. Um, I did end up changing careers, obviously, but... It, it kind of falls in line with the fact that I wanted to study something that made absolutely no sense. Like the, the size of space and the size of stars and all of that, it just, you can't really comprehend it, which is actually something that I really liked. Um, and then for some research in undergrad, I ended up going to the New Jersey Institute of Technology because they had this solar program and there I spent two summers looking at these little high intensity spikes that come flying off of solar flares. Um, it was a really interesting project and it sort of introduced me to what research is like, which I really liked. Um, my supervisor at the time, he had made somewhat of a software program to kind of take in this mass amount of data and process it into something that was readable. Um, and then I, in my undergrad for astrophysics, I did an honors project. And with that, I decided I, I kind of wanted to kind of test the waters on a different field. So I sort of took a project that kind of makes both kind of quantum as well as the or sort of astrophysics aspect. The, the project was intended to try to show global entanglement is theoretically possible. And in order to do that, you use a bunch of satellites that project down a pair of qubits and you use quantum repeaters on the ground to sort of extend that entanglement globally. Um, it, was, it was a really interesting project. And to be honest, I have to say like my least favorite classes in undergrad were quantum mechanics, uh, linear algebra, and um, the computational physics course, which is pretty much all I do now. So it's just hilarious that this is how I ended up working here. Um, but yeah, so it was a really interesting project. I actually worked, I collaborated with a group in Waterloo with it, and I was working with like a quantum optics group in Calgary. Um, then I took a little bit of a divergence and I did a, this Canna Rock program. So how that works is they take 10 Canadian students, like undergrad students, and 10 Norwegian students, and they throw you all together at the Andoya rocket range in Norway and you try to figure out how to launch a rocket. So you learn the physics of how the rockets work and also like how to, how to pack the rocket such that it won't just spin out of control as soon as you try to launch it. Um, at the time, I'd also considered like maybe going into like rocket science, I guess you would call it. But um, I, after that program, it was, it was really cool and fun, but I realized that it really wasn't what I was looking for. I was still sort of chasing this very, confusing field that I hadn't really found yet. Um, but for any undergrad students that are watching this right now, I strongly recommend applying. I'm pretty sure that they're actually still holding it. I participated, I think, seven years ago, but um, strongly recommend. Uh, so then for some more undergrad research, this was after I, I graduated from my undergrad, but I decided to take a year off to kind of figure out 
what direction I wanted to go in for research. So I did a few different research projects. Um, one of them that's notable that we ended up actually publishing was my supervisor that was quantum optics at the time. Um, he got it in his head that what if these axons in your brain are actually waveguides? And, and I should premise with, we weren't trying to make any statements about like quantum consciousness or all these, these crazy things. But as an optics team, we decided like, we're really good at optics and there's these biophotons that are being emitted by gray, ma gray matter in your brain. So like, what if the two go together and we can use that? So we ended up showing that these biophotons actually were being guided down the axons in your brain. We didn't really make a lot of conclusions on what that sort of path of potential information could be used for. Um, but it was really interesting to see that it actually worked, especially because the axons in your brain, they sort of like, none of them are straight at all. They sort of like kind of weave in between the rest of the gray matter in your brain. Um, but yeah, it did turn out that the, the um, wavelength of these biophotons were, were transmitted very well. Um, and I would say that this project was very interesting to me because I also hadn't even taken bio in high school because in like grade 10 science, I tried out bio and I was just terrible at it. So it was pretty hilarious that I ended up then just jumping into neuroscience where I had no idea what any of the terminology meant. I started by trying to like just read papers, which was obviously a mistake. And then I had to like go back and like learn just basic bio because I couldn't just Google every single word in the papers because that's not very efficient. Um, so then after that, I decided to do this program called UseQuip. And this is actually out of the University of Waterloo. There's me right there, the big arrow. Um, I got that photo off of Facebook, so it's very grainy. But uh, yeah, so it was also a very interesting program. And I would say that it was like, it's what got me fully both feet in the water with quantum computing. Um, it was a two-week program that the IQC, the Institute of Quantum Computing, puts on. And yeah, I think that it was a really fantastic introduction to kind of all of the different sort of areas of quantum computing. And yeah, it, it seemed like I had finally found this like extremely counterintuitive feel that I've been kind of always looking for. Um, still to this day, like logically, none of it makes any sense, but we can prove it with math and we can prove it with everything else and physically. So we know it's true, but don't let any quantum physicist lie to you and tell you that it makes sense because it doesn't. Um, but yeah, so any, any undergrad students that are on this also really recommend UseQuip. Um, they put it on every year. I still keep seeing UseQuip students every year. Um, definitely worth looking into if you want to get more into quantum computing. Um, so now I, I guess about five years ago, I started in the master's program at the University of Waterloo. And then the fun thing about physics is you can just transfer into the PhD program after about a year and a half. Um, so I did that so I wouldn't have to write two theses. Um, but yeah, so I've been there ever since. And my research mostly focuses on detecting these really hard to find errors in quantum systems. So there's just, a, I don't want to get too far into it, but there's just a bunch of errors that can come up. And so we have different protocols in order to like get an idea of what that error model looks like. And also to be able to distinguish ones that are like calibration errors, like ones that will keep growing as you increase the number of operations you're doing, which is different than like decoherent errors, which are just kind of like always on, but don't really build on each other. Um, but yeah, so, so that's mostly what I focus on. And my final research project for my PhD, I'm working with a bunch of experimental groups around the world and we are setting a standard for what actually should be applied when you're trying to test how well your quantum device is working. The problem with our field right now is that there's like a bunch of different benchmarking protocols, which like largely came out of our research group. And so we're just trying to like nail down what you should actually be applying in order to be able to compare with other groups and other types of devices. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's a very exciting time and I've been able to work with a lot of experiment, like different experimental groups, which has really been fun. Um, but yeah, the problem with a lot of the protocols is that there's like a lot of freedoms with them. So then when each group makes all these decisions on what kind of freedoms that they want to utilize, then 
you can't really make like a cross platform comparison if everybody's doing it slightly differently. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really exciting time. And I've actually finished writing my thesis and I'm just waiting on experimental results from other groups just so we can like have everybody together and kind of push it forward. Um, so about two years into my, maybe, maybe three years in my PhD, I realized that as much as I love doing research and as much as I love um, academia and also just the process of finding out these crazy things, um, I realized that I didn't really think that academia was the path I wanted to continue on. And so actually at the time I was trying to contemplate like, well, if I'm not gonna go into academia, should I really complete a PhD? And around that time, my supervisor, Joseph Emerson, he came out and said, like, I've actually started a company We're we're going to make software and we're going to um, really make it accessible for people around the world to just run these protocols we've developed instead of each individual group having to try to read the paper, decipher what it means, and then try to implement it themselves, which we found over the last, like, 10 years, a lot of the groups weren't even doing it correctly and so weren't getting the, the outputs that they should actually be um, talking about. So yeah, so that was really exciting because then I sort of had a reason to stay in a PhD, which was to continue to work at Quantum Benchmark. So ever since then, yes, my, my main role is as a researcher, but I also, I love taking on a bunch of different responsibilities. And so I'm kind of like the multiple hat wearer of the company along with a few others, because it's a startup and that's how startups work. But it's been really exciting because a lot of like the interpersonal skills that I've always been had really strong interpersonal skills, I've actually been able to utilize them. Um, it's, it's actually pretty hard to be a theoretical physicist as well as an extrovert, because they don't really go hand in hand because you sit alone in a room for a few years and then go crazy slowly. So it was really nice to actually be able to use those skills with sales or even like um, employee things. But yeah, I found that every day is, is pretty different and I'm still getting to do my research, which is incredible, as well as take on all these other responsibilities. So I'll get more into um, what Quantum Benchmark actually does now. So we are, we are a software company and we've put all of these diagnostic tools into a software platform, as well as we have some air suppression um, techniques as well. So, so for the scalable air diagnostics, this is all of these different protocols that we, as well as other groups around the world have developed over the last 20 years. Uh, and I should premise with Joseph Emerson, my supervisor actually invented the field, I think about 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so we have all these scalable tools that can help you validate and improve the accuracy of all these different um, applications that you might be trying to apply. And then the kind of bulk of the interesting stuff. So that other part tells you what's wrong with your system and if it's calibration errors or if it's these kind of floating errors or um, how bad your system is working so that when you get an output, what that looks like. But the more interesting part of it is this error suppression aspect. So you can run something called cycle benchmarking, which sort of randomizes your error enough that these errors that like, like to grow on each other kind of get turned into this like decoherent error that doesn't really grow. Um, and John Martinez had previously said he couldn't imagine building a quantum computer without it. Um, it is kind of a building block because then now you have way more logical qubits because your error rate can be significantly suppressed. So kind of looping back to this best of both worlds aspect, I think I've been really lucky that I've been able to get industry experience as well as complete my PhD. And um, it's great to actually be able to use these interpersonal skills that I have kind of thrown on the back burner for a few years. It's nice to have every day be very different and to continue to like grow the number of things that I can help the company with. Um, it's interesting when you sort of get thrown into the deep end <laughs> to just try to figure out like how businesses work and try to help out as much as I can. Cause um, Joseph Emerson is very business oriented and he understands it. And it's, it's nice to have a mentor that is kind of pushing me to like contribute more and more to the company. Um, 
the really interesting part of my last research project is I also worked with on the quantum benchmark side throughout the time as well. So I got to work with these various hardware platforms around the world and I got to meet all these um, hardware developers, which was very enlightening because as a theoretical physicist, I haven't really been in a lab before. So it was nice to actually fully grasp what's physically causing these errors and how my protocols can actually be adjusted to like detect certain specific errors that are from those platforms. Um, the other really cool thing about being a grad student as well as working at the company is that when I come up with a new protocol to test some aspect of the error profile, um, within a month, it's in the software and then it's used globally around the world by all these different hardware developers. So instead of the sort of standard way of I write a paper, which takes me a few months at least, and then someone a few months later decides maybe I should try to read this. And then a few months after that, they actually try to implement it. It's now just fast track so that people can actually start using these new tools like immediately. The other thing I really like about working at a startup instead of like maybe a bigger company is that my voice is heard, right? There's, there's, I think we have 15 employees at the company. And so um, with that number, when we're trying to decide what direction to go or how to improve something for a client or a customer, um, anybody that has an opinion is allowed to have their voice heard, which I think is, is really, is lovely. And then also I'm able to like grow as a business person a lot more quickly than I would as just a researcher. Um, I have a few takeaways. Um, I think from the reason why I can actually be confident when I say, I think I've found what I want to do with my career is because I actually have tried a bunch of different types of research. Um, I found that a lot of my friends that have only ever been in quantum computing at the end of their PhD, they don't really know if this is something they want to continue. So I think that for any undergrad and especially grad students, I think it's important to try a bunch of different types of research and figure out what it is that you like or don't like about the type of research and be willing to pivot. Um, the other thing that I'd say to people specifically in academia is it's not as pushed on students in grad school, especially that industry is an option. And I'd always, I had never really thought about considering it because I'd always been on this path of wanting to go into academia. But I find that I'm learning so much more by being in industry and there's a lot more opportunities in industry, especially because the type of field we're in, it's very commercializable. So you can actually push that envelope forward. Um, the other thing is if you want to get into industry or even in further into academia, it's really important to kind of put yourself out there and meet people like you're going to do with this, this conference. I think that it's a really great opportunity for people to connect and then kind of see what their options are. It's really hard when you're in academia because it does seem like the only option is to stay in academia, but that's not true at all, especially for our field. And I think also it's important to step out of your comfort zone. It's very easy to say like, I like research, but what if you also like talking or like giving talks like this or working in industry or different types of research? Like, I think it's important to realize what your comfort zone is and then intentionally try to take steps out of it to just see if you enjoy it. Anyways, that, that's all of my talk, but thank you so much for listening.